What's up guys? It's Lil Beauty Demon and I'm back and I'm finally back with a true crime story. I know I've been saying that in the last few videos that I would get one to you and here it is. So it's taken me a while. I wanted to make sure I had all my research good and also I've just been really busy with making sure that I have enough time properly set aside to give this the attention that I want to. Today's story is actually not necessarily like the first few stories I've done have all been like murders and stuff. I mean, people do die in the story, but our protagonist, antagonist, bit of both. Our subject today rather is a person of interest named Patty Hurst. So we will be diving all the way into that. Before we get started, if you like this type of content, please don't forget to like and subscribe and uh, you can turn on the notification bell because I really don't have a, uh, what do you call it, schedule? for uploading. I do commentary videos. I do true crime videos, usually centered around makeup. Also, I am over 300 subscribers. Totally crazy. So super excited about that. If you are one of my new subscribers, thank you for joining. And if this is the first video you're ever seeing, that's pretty cool. So we're going to talk about somebody named Patty Hurst. And the name Hearst, you, you may have heard it before and you may have heard this story before. It was kind of a big deal in the 70s. Patty Hearst is the granddaughter of a very wealthy capitalist, I guess. William Randolph Hearst, who he was really big in like money and government and print. And actually a lot of magazines today are still owned by the Hearst company and Hearst family. Lots of them. So they own lots of different newspapers and publications like around the United States. He even served on the Senate. I might even do a future video about him because he did have a really suspicious incident happen when he was present, but we're not going to focus on that today. We're going to focus on his granddaughter, Patricia or Patty. She actually never really went by Patty until the incident that we're going to talk about today. Also, before I get into this, I want to give a shout out to my girl Libby. I went and got my hair done by her last weekend and I was actually going to film this video last weekend, but I was super tired from driving and going, getting my hair done. But she did an amazing job on my color. She removed all this color, did this amazing hair treatment, and then did a lot of cool highlight, low light, balayage things. I don't, I don't know what she did. I went to her because she's the professional. Now let's get into Patty Hearst officially. So Patty was born on February 20th, 1954. Her parents were Randolph Hearst and her mother was Catherine. I don't know who cares what her last name was. So Randolph was the fourth of five children, specifically sons. He was actually a twin. It's like a random weird fact. And he was technically heir to his father's fortune, but he had so many siblings that, you know, he's not the only one. But at the point of, you know, Patty's birth and most of Patty's life, he wasn't really like in any of the actual family businesses per se. He was involved to some extent, but he wasn't like a major like mover and shaker in any of the Hearst family businesses. I don't know what you would call them. They had a lot of different ventures and stuff like that, but he was, he was still very successful. I mean, the name Hearst in and of itself just brings a lot of power and money. And of course they just had it, you know, it's just a classic case of old money. So I'm gonna call her Patty, even though I said like no one ever called her Patty until this because like everybody called her Patty because of this. So it would just be weird to call her anything but. So Patty went to, you know, the finest schools, private schools, boarding schools, all that stuff. And she went to Menlo College in 1973. I think that was the year, I can't exactly find out, but it, it really doesn't matter. She actually graduated high school early. She had a tutor named Stephen Weed. He became her boyfriend. Gross. Her parents really didn't like him. Can't imagine why. And when Steve received a fellowship at the University of California in Berkeley, Patty enthusiastically transferred to that university right away so she could live with Steven. And they pretty quickly got engaged, much to her parents' dismay. And I mean, it's just gross. Like he was her tutor in high school. So at like this point she was like 19. I mean, I'll throw a picture up here. He 
definitely looked like he was at least into his mid to late 20s. They did plan to get married that summer after Patty finished her sophomore year of college. But you know, Patty was 19. When you're 19 years old, you're going through a lot of changes, a lot of different things. Her relationship was beginning to kind of go south and she really didn't like admitting that because, you know, she had fought so adamantly with her parents for their support of this whole entire relationship and she kind of sunk into a little bit of a depression because of this. Also, when you're 19, you're just finding out a lot of new stuff about the world. She's in college. She's at the University of Berkeley in the 1970s, like huge transformative time. In the 1970s, a lot of radical changes were happening in the Western world and obviously were affecting other parts of the world too because we were just kind of butting our heads in where it didn't necessarily belong or wasn't welcome. There was a lot of political change a lot of political demonstrations, a lot more riots. There was actually, I think it's a thousand political bombings in the United States over the course of the 1970s, over the course of 10 years. Like that's insane. We also saw like a lot of serial killers come out of the 1970s too. This also brings us to a radical organization called the Symbonies Liberation Army. Honestly, Symbonies Liberation Army is a pretty misleading name because Symbonies is not a country from what I can find. It doesn't seem like a marginalized group of people or like anybody that's been displaced like as a refugee or anything. So it's not anything that really needs to be liberated. And the organization I think at most had 22 people, which is not much of an army. The SLA, which is what I'm going to start calling it from now on because it just takes too long to say Simonese Liberation Army over and over and over again, so I'm just going to call it the SLA. So the SLA was founded by a man named Donald DeFries, and he was born in Cleveland, Cleveland, Columbus, Cleveland, Cleveland. His father was a very violent man and actually broke both of his arms when he was a kid as punishment for, I don't even know, because there's really no punishment that is justifiable in breaking anybody's arm, much less a child's arm, much less both of their arms. At 14, uh, he actually dropped out of school and he went away to New York and he stayed with a priest for a while, but eventually he joined a gang. And then throughout the 1960s, he would go on and get arrested for a multitude of different things. Honestly, I'm just gonna kind of like read a bunch of stuff and I am paraphrasing this and there's a lot of other things that he was arrested for that, that didn't even make the list for me. So one time police picked him up and he had tear gas, uh, a sawed off rifle, which is at least nowadays considered a weapon of mass destruction and a knife. He fired a gun in his own basement one time, people called police. They found him at one point, I think he was riding a bike and they found that he had two homemade bombs on him. Yes, two, two bombs. I don't even know if I can say bombs on YouTube, but I'm, I'm gonna say it. And a gun. He had a gun on him when he had two bombs. You know what he got? Three years probation. Three years probation for two bombs. And the United States had a thousand domestic terrorist bombings in it. Gee, like, I feels like you were not taking anything seriously here. Yeah, so he served some time in prison. While he was in prison, records stated, you know, he might be uh, pretty dangerous and maybe we shouldn't be letting him out. I mean, he seems to enjoy guns like a lot and he likes to make things Things explode. Why would you let this man just off with like three years probation? So a prison therapist also said that it's quite possible that he was schizophrenic or maybe he had a schizo personality. He was also arrested for kidnapping in 1969, but the charges were dropped because he was actually already serving time in another prison. And he was serving time in prison in California for a bank robbery. All of this is gonna be coming up again later. After he robbed a bank, he ended up having a shootout with police where he got injured and then he was taken into custody and then he was found guilty of this bank robbery and all this stuff and he was sent to prison. While he was there, that was where he learned a lot of radical ideology, if you will. A lot of people do change to different religions and things because they actually meet a lot of new people in prison. But it was in prison that DeFries kind of created the foundations for what would become the SLA later on. In 1972, DeFries was transferred to Soldat Prison. In March of 93, he escaped and he ended up hiding out in Oakland, California. He hid out there with other former inmates and that was where he really started to recruit and solidify 
for the SLA. And because, you know, he created it, he was like, I get to be the official field marshal. On November 6, 1973, so just a couple months after he escaped from prison, the superintendent Marcus Foster and deputy superintendent Robert Blackburn were assassinated by members of the SLA. They used bullets that had been hollowed and filled with cyanide, which cyanide's a poison that basically, I don't know if it makes your blood stop absorbing oxygen or if it makes it so it can't deliver the oxygen but basically all of your cells and everything because everything in your body needs oxygen it makes it so nothing in your body gets oxygen and you die i think that was maybe a little bit overkill but they really wanted to make sure that these two fascists paid so why did they assassinate these two people what were they doing the sla was against the fact that the school was trying to institute school IDs. They considered that fascist, therefore they killed the superintendent. However, if these idiots had done any fucking research, they would have known that the superintendent was actually against the use of the school IDs and had been fighting the school board on it for quite a while. But, you know, honestly, are we surprised? Anytime there's any kind of like political zealot, they're just so misinformed. They don't have all the facts before they start speaking out and apparently murdering people. So that January the following year, uh, somebody from the SLA was found guilty of murdering the superintendent and the deputy superintendent. And in retaliation, the SLA decided, oh, this is war. We're going to take a prisoner of war. We're going to kidnap somebody influential. They decided on Patty Hearst. They didn't really know anything about her. They just knew that she came from a really wealthy family and she lived in the nearby area. And her address had been posted in the local newspaper not too long before announcing her engagement to her gross boyfriend, Stephen Weed. Ugh. On February 4th, Patty and her fiance, they were getting ready for bed. You know, she had her nightgown and everything on and members of the SLA busted into her house and kidnapped her. They hit her fiance over the head with a wine bottle and they carried her out and they threw her in the trunk. Neighbors said they tried to help the SLA open fire on them and shot up the entire neighborhood. So when they kidnapped Patty, they took her back to their hideout and she spent the next 57 days in captivity. She was tied up and blindfolded. She eventually learned that she was in a closet and DeFries would bring food and others would also come in and read their ideas theology to her and they would also come in and record things. They would record demands, essentially, her and DeFries. She would also testify that she was sexually assaulted, that they would, you know, force themselves upon her, especially DeFries, and eventually she would engage in other activities with other people as well. She's also threatened with other kinds of physical harm and that they might even harm her family if she tried to escape. So her first recording was basically just letting her family know that she was okay, she was alive, and DeFries had some demands. This recording was released three days after her initial capture, and it was released to a Berkeley radio station. DeFries demanded that the Hearst family feed every needy person in the in actually all of the state of California. I was gonna say just Los Angeles, but all of the state of California. Hattie's father, of course, got these demands and he said they were outrageous and they were gonna be impossible to meet. I'm assuming Patty probably heard this and that was a huge blow to her emotional state because here she is kidnapped and then her parents are like, oh my God, we're not gonna be able to do that. Because in the next recording, she said, stop acting like I'm already dead. Whatever you do, will be fine. So in order to get $2 million worth of food to people in California, they developed what was called People in Need or PIN. The program was expected to feed 100,000 people for a year and it would have like four scheduled distribution points, I think. So they had their first distribution and it went 
horribly. Became pretty much a full-blown riot, totally. Like, that's really what it was. It was heavily criticized by Ronald Reagan, who at that point, he was the governor of California. DeFreeze kind of accused Randolph Hearst of not doing enough and that he needed to donate another six million dollars. Randolph said he couldn't do that, but he agreed to another two million dollars for the safe return of Patty and then another um, installment later on a few months down the road. So after that, other distribution points, they went fine. There were no more riots or anything like that. So in the fourth recording that was released, Patty pretty much accused her parents of not doing anything at all at this point. A lot of the ideology that the SLA was pumping into her about capitalism and how her parents don't care about her and then the overall crappy state of the world, I can tell was really getting to her. She's really starting to identify and focus with them. This is a huge part of what people would later identify as Stockholm syndrome or hostage identification syndrome, which is where you start to personally identify with your captures which is what Patty started to experience. Because when you have Stockholm Syndrome, you identify with your capture completely. You pretty much get the feeling that they're the only ones that are protecting you from whatever the external forces are, which isn't always the case. You know, they're telling Patty they're protecting her from the outside world, her parents, the media, all that stuff. And of course she's starting to believe them. And then they're also showing her things with how bad the pin distribution is going and how the governor of California is really fighting against it. So it's really feeding into this whole, this whole narrative that they're creating essentially. Now this isn't to say that Patty 100% trusts the SLA, but she has more trust in them than she does with the outside world at this point. And it was on at some point around this time when they began to be a little more lenient with her and actually let her out of the closet and start to participate in things a little more and be involved in planning of actions and that they were going to be taking against the man. Now on April 2nd, the SLA did say that they were going to be releasing Patty in 72 hours, so by April 4th. However, the next day, Patty was like, no, I'm not going. You can't make me. And she joined the SLA. Patty would actually testify in court that when DeFreeze told her that she was free, she like didn't believe him and that was why she stayed. She thought she would still get killed. Then Patty made the most infamous recording where she stated that she joined the SLA. It was also accompanied by a photo of her officially joining. I used to have this picture hanging in my room when I was in high school. She denounced her family. She referred to her parents as pigs. She probably felt like her family had just kind of quit on her, you know, and she's completely isolated from the outside world and has no idea what's going on. But Patty had no way of knowing that her father had been actually talking to former SLA members in prison to try and negotiate some way to get Patty home. So now that she officially joined them, Patty was getting more lessons in like weapons training and stuff like that, becoming more of an integral part of the organization. She also became romantically involved with one of them and that would later come up in court as well. All right, so before I go into any Anything. I don't want you guys to judge me, but I have not been wearing like real, real foundation recently. I've just been wearing three different kinds of concealers and I'm pretty much just gonna smear this shit all over my face. So. so have fun making fun of me on that. And I've also been using this elf sponge that I really like. So on April 15th, only 12 days after her fifth recording, the SLA robbed a bank and Patty was front and center for the recordings. They all had disguises on and Patty had on a brown wig for some reason. I don't know if they thought like people weren't gonna recognize her or whatever. At first, the FBI wasn't really sure like what Patty's role was in all of this. So they made wanted posters for everybody that appeared there, but for Patty, instead of having her wanted for armed robbery, they actually had her listed as a material witness. The next day though, Patty released a recording. No one had like a gun pointed at her at any point when they were in the bank. Everything that she did there 
was of her own free will. She called her family pigs again, and she called her fiance an ageist, sexist pig. But at this point, the SLA knew like, oh God, the FBI, they're, they're gonna be on to us now. So they flee their apartment and just in time too, because like, I think it's literally the next day the FBI shows up and is like, oh, fuck, we just fucking missed him. So they went from like the Oakland County area to more like the Bay area. And they were kind of laying low for a little bit. And they wanted to start recruiting, start getting people more involved again. And this is when they start to make like demands of people in the area that are like helping them out and stuff. And people start to get really annoyed. Like, the fuck are you? Just like coming in here like demanding that I do this shit for you or that I find this shit for you. Like, I don't know you. On May 16th, Patty and somebody named William and Emily, I don't know anybody's like gorilla name. So I'm just calling them by their like regular legal name. They went to a sporting goods store called Mel's Sporting Goods for supplies and stuff. They were in Inglewood area. As they were checking out, William decided that he was gonna try and shoplift something, which turned into the security guard confronting him and then Mel pulling out a gun and pointing it at him. And it became like a full blown shootout. Now Patty was in the van, so she saw all this happening and she kind of has this moment of like, I could just like drive away right now because she was all alone or she could, you know, in involve herself in the shootout. So that's what she did. She pulled out a automatic weapon and she emptied it onto the storefront. So now everybody knew that the SLA was in town. The very next day, the FBI is closing in on the apartment where they know that DeFreeze and the SLA are and it becomes a full-blown shootout. It's televised, everybody sees it. The SWAT team is there. Eventually police and SWAT threw uh, tear gas in and it caused the house to go up in flames. There were no survivors. Um, DeFreeze was in the home, but it was determined that Patty was not in the home. So Patty and the Harrises, who William and, and Emily Harris, I didn't say their last name, they were at a motel near Disneyland. So I guess they were like, let's get out of here, let's go to Disneyland. They were watching the whole thing on the news and they were like, holy shit, we're like the only ones. She and the Harrises went on the run. Along the way, they did get some kidnapping charges. I read this really interesting article. This guy who, as a teenager, he was kind of kidnapped by them for a few hours, but he was like super chill about it the whole time. He was just like, oh yeah, yeah, Patty, her, uh, she she kind of took my car for a little bit and we drove around and stuff and then they dropped me off. It was weird. So then they go into hiding for a year. Nobody hears from them at all. Eventually her family even drew like, withdrew like the monetary rewards for her and everything because they, you know, hadn't seen or heard from her in a while. They didn't know if she was even alive. Then on September 18th, 1975, Patty Hearst and three other members of the SLA were arrested. She was only 87 Pound. She told officers when she was arrested that her occupation was urban gorilla. And she told her attorney to tell everyone that I'm smiling and that I feel free and strong and that I send my greetings and love to all the sisters and brothers out there. Okay, Patty. Catherine, Patty's mom, seemed to think Patty would not face any sort of like serious repercussions. And the media assumed that as well because it was kind of like a classic case of like, rich girl can maintain his crime, she's probably gonna be fine. They would, you know, make the argument of like, well, she was like primarily a kidnap victim. She never did anything of her own free will. Ma'am, she made a recording saying that she totally did. Catherine was very, very wrong. So on February 4th, 1976, uh, exactly two years to the day of her initial kidnapping, Patty's trial began. But now Patty was no longer the urban gorilla she was when she had been arrested in September. Now she had reverted back to sweet, homely, conservative, couldn't hurt a fly, Trisha Hurst. And her attorney was F. Lee Bailey, who later went on to be part of O.J. Simpson's defense team. So of course, the defense goes with the brainwashing claim. That's the best claim that we can go with in this kind of situation. Patty suffers from Stockholm Syndrome. End of story. Problems with that though, is that she did make multiple recordings saying that she was doing everything of her own free will. And I mean, even if you're brainwashed, you still robbed a bank and you shot up a store, so 
Like, you still have to be held accountable for that in some way, shape, or form. She was, however, only being charged for the robbery. She was not charged with the shooting. Patty's defense team tried to argue that the robbery was staged just so they could, you know, kind of put pictures and stuff of Patty in the media. Uh, but like, they still did rob the bank. You can't, you can't deny that. They also had over 200 hours of psychiatric expert testimony about her her entire mental state and everything that went on. Like, this is just, oh my God, if I was a juror, I probably would have fallen asleep. Even though it's like really interesting, I'm sure you're hearing the same stuff over and over and over again. But the most influential was the government psychologist, Joel Fort. He told jurors to be skeptical of most of the psychiatric testimonies because all of these people had been hired by the defense and they wanted to help Patty. They wanted to see Patty get better. They didn't necessarily want her to be punished for her crime. So they may be also favorable of a lesser sentence for her because they see her more as a patient not as somebody who's, you know, standing trial. He also said that, you know, evidence had showed that Patty had always been rebellious, lied to nuns that her mom had cancer so she could get out of taking a test. She had been very sexually promiscuous at an early age. Well, I mean, it seems like in that sense, she had been kind of being taken advantage of by an older man. And also that she had like experimented with drugs as well, which I mean, come on, you guys, sex and drugs. That's like always like the thing to blame, whatever. So Patty did have to take the stand because of this whole like brainwashing defense. So people had to hear what her side was for a lot of this. She would get some super embarrassing questions about her sex life. Patty actually pled the fifth 42 times while she was on the stand. And pleading the fifth basically means like you don't wanna answer the question because you feel like the answer could incriminate you. So in the end, the jury did not buy this. They said maybe she was brainwashed, but really her story had too many holes and they found her guilty and she was sentenced to seven years in prison. While she was in prison, um, Patty's lung collapsed. Like that's crazy because she was still in her 20s. Other members of the SLA, of course, had also been arrested with her. So they also were standing trial for, of course, her kidnapping, but then also the robbery and I think even the shootout as well. She was going to be testifying, but she couldn't because of, you know, her lung had collapsed. When she got back, they didn't take her protection seriously for a while until a dead rat was placed in her bed the day of one of the Harris's arraignments or like sentencing hearings. And then she was in solitary confinement for quite a while. When she was in prison, there were a lot of people that were lobbying for her to get out, including House of Representative Leo Ryan. He was petitioning for her to be released as well because she, you know, initially started off as the victim of all of this. Unfortunately, Leo Ryan was killed in the Jonestown area area on an airfield. He was the government official that went down there to see what the heck was going on and members of the Jonestown cult killed them. So that's a really weird side story about that. However, in 1979, President Jimmy Carter commuted her sentence as time served. So she only spent two years in prison. Definitely got that rich girl treatment. And then she petitioned for a very long time to have it just like removed from the record or what is that called? Pardoned? She wanted to have it pardoned, but Jimmy Carr didn't do that. In 1981, <clears throat> she published her memoirs and some people were like, um, some of this stuff isn't exactly some of the things that we talked about in the trial and stuff. I feel like there might be some new charges coming, but no one ever, press new charges. Also two months after she got out, she married Bernard Lee Shaw, who was an officer that helped her with her bail security, which once again, that's just like, I mean, they stayed married until his death, but it just seems like slightly unethical for an officer to be marrying somebody that they're like providing security for. She and her husband actually had two kids. One of them is a model and actress, Lydia Hurst Shaw, which I'd seen before, but I didn't know she was her daughter at all. Patty has also gone on to be in several John Water movies. My favorites are Crybaby. She's the good girl's mom, I think is she's her mom. Yeah, and then she's also in Cecil B. Demented, 
which I, I don't really remember what character she is off the top of my head, but I do remember that she's in that. And then as of late, Patty has been entering her dog in the Westminster Kennel Dog Show. She has a couple dogs of different breeds that she's been entering and they all do very well. I'm gonna do my brows and my lashes real quick and then I'll come back for my final remarks. All right guys, I'm back. I didn't realize I would end the story before I finished my makeup. So anyway, you guys, that is the story of the kidnapping of Patty Hearst by of a made-up army from some man who should have spent a lot more time in prison because he did a lot of crazy things, but of course he was already in prison and escaped. The whole idea of Stockholm Syndrome is very interesting. I don't know if I would have believed her if I was on the jury as well, just because there was a lot of like evidence. But I do understand that when you're in like those kinds of situations, you just kind of do whatever you can to survive, so. I don't know. I'm not anyone to judge because I obviously was not on the jury. It's still a really fascinating case and it's really interesting to like read and learn about Stockholm Syndrome. So that's kind of what has always drawn me to this and is what always like fascinated me throughout the years. Hopefully this is actually a shorter true crime video than some of my others. I feel like it had been a while since I'd done a true crime story so I may have been a little rusty with this. Like I said at the beginning of the video, if you like this, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And because I do not have a regular upload schedule, turn on the notification so you get notifications every time I upload a video. That is it for today's video. I am Lo. I will see you guys in my next video. Laters. Bye.